Good day and welcome to this cafe for the Worst Institute. My name is Guillaume Tardif and I work at the Department of Music as a violinist and I will talk to you today about a recording project to come up shortly with the Worst Institute featuring music by Central European composers, among the most famous ones indeed, Mozart, Beethoven and Wieniawski. This project uh, revives a concert that was given at Convocation Hall here on campus a number of years ago and uh, featuring uh, my colleague pianist Jacques Desprez and myself into a recital program of sonatas and variations, so that will be the title of the CD itself. Let's look first into the program, then let's have a bit of a talk with Jacques Desprez about his impressions and such, and then uh, spend some time in a few movements to get a sense of what's in there and hear some of the tracks along the way. Let's start with our program and I will describe it to you here on the board. We chose the 26th sonata by Mozart, written around 378, it's his code in the Kirchel catalog, and it is uh, in sonata in B flat major, this key. It is lovely sonata in three movements, already part of the more mature style of Mozart, he's 23 years old at the time, and uh, apparently wrote it in Salzburg to be published by Artaria in Vienna as part of a set to become his Opus 2. The first movement, as usual, in the classical sonata has the concept of sonata form with multiple themes that involves different characters. Sonata is like a theater in music, characters uh, being introduced, then uh, some plot is developing, and then reintroduced after all of this into a form of reconciliation. Uh, then a lead form, the song lead, uh, so this is uh, something that will involve obviously a very lyrical type of play. And then a rondo form to conclude it all, so rondo means we're coming back many times to the same uh, tune, it's very tuneful. And with episodes, so one of those episodes will be in the relative key of G minor. Uh, the movement will unfold a little bit like an operatic scene. As you know, Mozart was known for his uh, love of opera. He was bracing and, and just hoping for more operas. And he would make this happen in the instrumental chamber music styles as well. Uh, there's a revolution in between Mozart and Beethoven. More massive work of his sonatas for violin. There are ten of those. The ninth one, dedicated to Rodolf Kreutzer and known as the Kreutzer Sonata, is his Opus 47 in A. It is not defined as major or minor because one movement is in major, one is in minor. And it's also in three movements following similar ideas. So the large first movement starts with a slow introduction, adagio, a typical of that uh, Beethovenian feel, and leads us to oh, a, and a presto, very agitated and, and basically restless uh, most of the time. It was also a bit on its own. It's written in 1803 in Vienna for the particular occasion of the visit of Mr. Bridgetower from London, who was uh, uh, asking Beethoven to, to feature a new work like that. And actually Mozart and Beethoven apparently these works would have been performed at the Augarten uh, in Vienna, so uh, botanical gardens and, and uh, porcelain factory and so on. Uh, that was developed by uh, the emperor for the enjoyment of the, uh, the public. That already links these two works together, but you will see also musical characteristics that, that are very similar. The second movement, the larger movement of uh, the set and the, and the CD as well, will be, uh, they call it simply theme and variation. Uh, at least five variations, virtuosic and, and very beautifully uh, crafted by the composer showcase all the, the tools of the trade that Beethoven was known for in terms of development of, of uh, texture and gestures. The Rondo sonata form is um, also a, an important movement, a large movement, that was apparently composed first before the other two. So it was a bit uh, of, a, of a rush for Beethoven to get to this uh, concert uh, that Bridgetower was asking and he puts this concert using materials that he had discarded for another sonata earlier, the number 6 sonata, in the same key A. And it has the allure of a tarantella, so also quite restless, as it is a dance uh, featuring 
uh, quick movement to try to uh, counteract the effects of the poison or the bite of the tarantula. That's the story. So altogether, this, this work has made its way, but it was a difficult uh, start. I'll talk more about that with Jacques Desprez in the next section. In uh, the picture of our program, it was concluding with a bravura piece, a showpiece by Vinyevsky, uh, the most probably uh, important composer, violinist, uh, following Paganini, the next generation of uh, Paganini that at least we know uh, much about. In, uh, there's a competition by the name of Vinyevsky uh, in Poznan and uh, Lublin. And we have uh, from Vinyevsky many works that have entered. It is, he was quite a good composer. He started very early, and he was actually a student of Mr. Uh, Massab, who was a student of, or the main important student and successor at the Paris Conservatoire, of Mr. Kreuzer. So you see a direct connection between basically two generations of violinists that, uh, that through this program. Massard himself wrote in variation on original themes, so this is, um, this is uh, maybe an idea that uh, Vinyevsky uh, was inspired by and, and took from. In the case of uh, Vinyevsky, the piece uh, was actually uh, written in the area of Leipzig, apparently, because he had composed a concerto that he played with the orchestra there in Leipzig, and he befriended the concertmaster of that orchestra and dedicated those variations to him. Uh, Benyevsky was always on tour all his life, uh, rather short life but very intense, and uh, these variations have remained as one of his major works in terms of uh, ability as a composer. You'll notice the very variations are at every level, and um, virtuosity, which makes it a perfect uh, display work for, for violinists. This is a program that, again, uh, has uh, some variety, and we hope you will enjoy it on the CD. So it's my great pleasure to uh, introduce here my colleague Jacques Desprez, who is uh, joining us from his house here in Edmonton. But, uh, and he's right there at the piano with the music in front of him. And uh, he's going to talk to us a little bit about those works from his perspective. And I'm, um, I, I, we were just talking a little bit before discussing about aspects that uh, are of interest to us as performers, but also as, as, as musicians studying these, these great works. Uh, what kinds of aspects uh, struck you, Jacques, when it comes to the Mozart Sonata, for example, the B flat major? Well, as with so much Mozart, there is the element of uh, a, a lyricism that is quite different than the lyrical side of Beethoven. Beethoven sometimes seems much more, especially in slow movement, to tell a story, but quite differently. It's not the, the lyrical element that we find. I'm always kind of imitating. The, 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 the singer. And as a matter of fact, I mean, the violin does that even more so. Okay, and I do recall uh, going minor and the dramatic, but the opening of this movement is quite, quite amazing, the slow movement when we think about that. You know. see that's something quite lyrical but then I mean the violinist does the same phrase after that it's a wonderful conversation and but when I think of the middle section also done <laughs> Really, we, we, we do our best to sing. We are limited, but you know, at the piano, but you know, we, we can manage to create a little bit of that and uh, orchestra element. Yeah. By the way, do you find it uh, easier to, to sing on the piano, the modern piano? Have you experienced playing on the forte piano? Well, you know, this piano was built 52 years after Beethoven's death. 
Yeah, that's that's of the time uh, time of Brahms. So, do you find in in fact that in order to create the lyricism, you are um, using more of the pedal technique in order to kind of smooth the the sound and make it in a in a this charming this charming sound that you hear from the forte piano otherwise. Yeah, but you know, there is a great harpsichord player that actually there was an article in New York Times about a month ago about him who passed away. His name is Scott Russ. You might oh, yes. Well, we know him. For, he was in Quebec City for a long time. He was time. teaching Laval University, but he's recognized as the one of the greatest harpsichord players. But he says in Masterclass that at the end, a harpsichord player has to deal with a couple of things, mostly when you play the note and how long the note is, which is very true. And at the piano, it's exactly when you play the note, how long it is going to be, and then after that, when um, you, you deal with dynamics. And, uh, and, and that is it. When you think about that, how loud the note is going to be. And uh, so when you play to do something lyrical, it's a combination of many things, but it's a combination of sometimes or even how you connect the note, uh, yeah. the delay of the note. And that's, all right. of that, that's what it creates, you know, when you do. do, do, do. Yes. Now yes. You see, I emphasize many things, but that's exactly timing, dynamics, all along. How you connect a note, and so if you do some Chopin, it'd be the same thing, and it's no, nothing magical. Well, well, it's just that it, there is no magic when you think about it. It's a science, but at the end, uh, it's the taste, the education, the a lot of the thing that can create that. But it, uh, it, it doesn't happen just like that either. Uh, and, and that, <laughs> yeah. This Something that uh, I said to you at some point in the process of the editing. I've listened to this recording so many times. Well, but yeah, that, yeah, you must know that, yeah. Yeah, but it's it almost has a therapeutic quality. Is that as you listen to the singing of uh, the artist, and uh, in your case on the piano, you realize all that that impulse and that that tension that builds up and that releases with the musical yeah. flow. So the, you are able to achieve that with timing, you're with with dynamic and contrast. And but yeah, it's an elegance that really is a healing elegance. In some ways, yeah. But you know, when I was singing with Beethoven, his singing is very different. For example, well, if I go to uh, even the slow move, is it lyrical like uh, like Mozart? Absolutely not. <laughs> Beethoven sometimes very uh, that'd be a different lyricism or even the so I think it's more like he uh, sometimes it would be when he, he, he has the uh, very lyrical element it's mostly like almost rec reciting a yes. talking element. It's not the embellishment that you know you will find a lyrical element with Mozart, but what I was yes. giving as an example. It's quite different. But it's just, I think that also for for Beethoven is really an orchestral composer that happened to write at the piano. And eventually you realize the piano was not that relevant, especially at the end of his output. I just, you know, I mean, his sonatas at the piano and even sonatas that we have, I mean, it, 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 it's not really always sometimes so, um, I would say, um, fluid at the yes. instrument. His virtuosity is uh, a virtuosity, like in the first movement, the Kreutzer, it's a virtuosity, it's a, uh, well, Carl Dahlhaus described that most as a virtuosity, a great, great musicologist, at one of the great of the 20th century. It's like a, a figurations, which is very true. I mean, you know, I mean, we look at, I mean, uh, for example, <laughs> not broken chords. I mean, yes. <laughs> yeah. You need to be always alert, but there's certainly yeah. something 
uh, that seems slower that takes place. The chords are not moving that fast, no. but they are very uh, agitated. So the emotion exactly. Exactly. Is, is very much different from Mozart. So, no, however, in the, the Mozart... You would think that this is like a Mozart... It's a figure yeah, 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 yeah. you have uh, the violin. It's not, you know, it's just it, it was at the piano. So the piano was not yet very developed. Hey, listen, Paganini had not come and uh, and walked a list from his kind of list. I had no idea what to do. And was a teenager. He had worked with Czerny and that was it. And didn't know really where to go. And Paganini comes to Paris and whoa. That changed the piano world. Thank you, Paganini. <laughs> just... Yeah, that actually brings a, maybe a, a sideways story, story of it being successfully performed in, in a morning concert, like at eight in the morning concert. They, they, they presented that with the composer in Bridge Tower, and there was some improvisation involved and, and so on. But then they didn't go along. They went for stage after Beethoven broke up, basically, with Bridge Tower and gave the sonata to Kreutze. Is Kreutzer didn't want it. He, wanted it. he hated it. Uh, but Kreutzer, following that, uh, his main student was Massard. And Massard was uh, a friend of Liszt, and they tried to play it in concert. Oh, but actually, the audience in Paris didn't want to hear it. So Liszt was already so famous, they preferred to hear Liszt play some more variations on opera themes of the day. So they kind of booed them out. They, they just stopped there. after the introduction. They just said, go away. We don't want to hear this. We want to hear some list uh, variation. So, uh, and then after that, Vinyevsky <laughs> took it over because Vinyevsky was a student of Massa and Mas uh, Vinyevsky made, uh, you know, some, some of his careers on the back of that Beethoven sonata, <laughs> playing with many great players like Rubenstein and so on. So it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful piece of history that we're having the chance to touch uh, and, and revive, but it has had art beginnings. But you know, I was thinking about that Vinyavsky a little bit, and you know what came to my mind? It was the Paganini, the 24th Caprice. But the 24th Caprice, when it's played with a guitar player, because ah. Paganini wrote that. A little interlude between each variations and in this Vinyavsky you, you know the violin has a lot of things sometimes even by himself you know the violin in this case you I'm seeing himself because it is you and then in between piano has a little interlude and you know because Paganini was he, he loved playing the mandolin and he had so much chamber music with you know a string trio which would be violin viola maybe or violin cello and guitar which is so delightful and charming it, it, you know of course we had but it's just that that piece the Vinyavsky there that we did together it's, it's reminded me of that I was thinking about that this morning with these interludes made me think of that beautiful Caprice the 24th that we all know List also wrote variation and see Paganini's influences sometimes we don't realize but there are sometimes cross-pollination and it, it floats around Schumann uh, fell in love with Paganini as well. The influence Paganini was tremendous. And Schumann, I mean, even wrote a compliment for the Caprice. And he was obsessed with that, especially he was at that time quite ill. And uh, he, he stated that one of the greatest elements of Paganini's virtuosity was his ability to have the violin sing. So that, that I think that's always a compliment. It, it comes down to uh, the piano as well. What comes down to then when you think about that virtuosity is kind of the magic. Virtuosity, one can think of Liszt in Weimar and conducting in the first half of concert the Berlioz Symphonie Fantastique. The second half, he sits at the piano and he plays the Symphonie Fantastique, his own arrangement. People congratulate him afterwards. Say, it's unbelievable. The piano was louder than the orchestra. Is it possible? No. It is the magic of virtuosity. Basically, you make believe. And that's what it is, virtuosity, is that it's not being a charlatan or just cheap tricks. No, it's just the ability to create something that is, is, is quite imaginative and magical. And being a virtuoso at the end, the best description of that is, I uh, forgot exactly where I read that, but you know, somebody was asking virtuoso, a virtuoso said, what is most important for you? The answer was comfort. Ah. <laughs> so if you struggle, you're not a virtuoso. Yes. <laughs> it's, just, it's just this, the ease. And yes, actually, this is something that uh, uh, sh shows in the recording when you do these interludes by Vinyevsky, where you, you were just mentioning about the time in Mozart in order to make sing. And you have these uh, boisterous type of interludes that could be played in a very uh, square way. But actually, you, you move the time a little bit. You use rubato in order to create an effect of, of uh, rush, 
or, or holding and creating grandiose effect. And, yeah. and that is indeed creating an effect that on the recording, it's quite loud, but, but, but it, you know, it, the expression is bigger than an orchestra, certainly there. It's exactly this is what it, it comes out. But then at the end, uh, when you look at these elements, I mean, these little section, I mean, you had a lot of work in that. For me, it was the easy part. These things yeah. are just like, if you know a little bit how to do it, it, it's not that difficult, but it can be, you know, you had to play the game. Basically, you had to, to, I don't know, hopefully develop some sort of flair. Hopefully it was successful enough, but it's just that's part of the, the idea of creating an illusion. Yeah. Yes, and, and I know that you're very much uh, interested in the idea of elegance. Yeah. So yeah. when, when uh, it comes to, as a performer, approaching a piece that you're going to record or that you're, you're performing uh, in front of an audience, essentially is the same feeling, but you know that when it becomes a document, that you want to capture that elegance. And this is the art of the performer in a way is to be able to, to create a product that uh, will stay as elegance from one time to the next year, listen to it. So any, any, any insights about this process? Well, you know, we can both agree with that. It's like, um, I would say that um, it's like a character actor. You, you don't go from one role if you're not a character actor. You, you, you know, some John Wayne is John Wayne in every movie he's done. A Sylvester Stallone is Sylvester Stallone. But then you think of Marlon Brando, mm, he really revolutionized uh, the acting in the US uh, following the Stanislavski method and Adler. I mean, so uh, therefore as a musician, uh, you, 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 you might also become a little bit like that, a character actor, which becomes like, well, simply put, one of my teachers, that wonderful teacher, George Shebok, uh, just said once in master class, uh, for me it was such an influence, said, you know, See, we both have accents, okay? We can't deny it, okay? But you see, in music, once you play Beethoven or you play Chopin, you play Bartok Debussy, you have to be able to remove that accent so that the music becomes your mother tongue. So that becomes the style. So if something, if it's Rossite, you become virtuoso. If it's yeah. something that is a, a Bach, well, it's a dance. You, you dance mostly. I mean, if, so every composer, it doesn't mean they're just one stereotype or just one way of doing that because with, within the output of the composer there'll be many many things it's like you know somebody wearing different clothes but it's still the same soul the same person although let me fait pas le monde non plus mais it's just like but still um, it, it, i think that's what it becomes it's like a character actor you know your material and you develop it as much as you can and hopefully you remove. I, mean, I remember once playing a Bach uh, prelude, and that teacher, Mr. Schubert, from the first part, he said, you sound so French. And he explained to me why. And he was right. So I had to get, remove my accent. But uh, that is uh, maybe leading to my next question. I, I know, for example, Kreuzer, you had to spend a whole lot of time to learn these notes, yeah. these figurations. It's, it's a massive undertaking. Uh, but you have learned uh, some of Beethoven's ways from other sonatas. Yeah, I played so, them all in sonatas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so how, how is that sonata compared to other works by Beethoven? That you, so is that one distinctive or is it so stylistic that you can say, well, it's well, like a reality of something else? This, you know, the difficulty comes down to playing these things on a modern instrument. Because, you know, this figuration works much better on a lighter instrument. So, for example, I've played a bunch of many, many pieces by Chopin on a period instrument in the 90s when I was uh, still living in New York. And uh, also then, I thought, wow, God, I can't play all these Chopin etudes. I'm not sweating. It's so simple, so easy, because the instrument allowed it. It was written for that. It's the same. So the Kreutzer is really tricky because this figuration creates so much sound that you have to play so lightly. And yet, on the modern instrument, it, it, there is so much power you can have. And then, well, of course, we have to find ways to make a good balance with the instrument, you know. I mean, the violin, although they might produce more sound, it's not played on gut string, the pitch is high. I mean, it's just like, but it's still, the, the balance becomes more of an issue. So the earlier Beethoven sonatas, although they're extremely different from one to another, um, they, 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 they present different challenge, problem, and rewards. But one thing that I've learned over the years while playing Beethoven is that he was an amazing pianist, but 
I, I, the pianism that we find is not a modern pianism. It's really an orchestral way of playing. So you have to adjust to that, and it's it's not always simple. It's not always simple. In the Kreutzer, I mean, even that Tarantella, the last movement, which is a Tarantella, basically, I mean, we can play that so driven, but then if we think of it as lighter uh, Tarantella, or really a character that soothes the music, uh, sometimes it solves a lot of technical problems. And um, uh, so the Kreutzer is challenging. There is no question. It's very challenging. But it's at the same time, it's a technique that uh, if you've done really a lot of good work and a good training, you have that in your hands if it's a traditional type of technique that you have and uh, but still quite challenging there is no question about that yeah well on that note i think uh, we covered many topics i would <laughs> like to thank you very much and my uh, pleasure. i so much look forward to uh, hearing you in person again uh, we enjoyed your virtual concerts and we wish you all the best thank you it was a pleasure doing that guillaume nice seeing you again a bientôt a bientôt au revoir <laughs>
uh, and you will hear it in this music. So these are um, these are symbols that we are used to uh, to recognize. So fear. Then we have sadness, which transpires in, in maybe more subtle ways. Some people say Mozart is full of sadness, while others may just see the joy. And it's something that is uh, a subtle emotion to describe. Some people say if you use minor chords, you automatically create sadness. Well, it's, it's for you to judge and we'll, we'll continue. And then finally, anger. Uh, anger that was not really part of the language of Mozart but uh, certainly the, the part of the language of Beethoven. He was kind of the one that brought anger in music and, and uh, we, 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 it made a mark. When people are angry, you kind of notice. So here we are with uh, this language and this way of looking at music and we're going to see it in the score. So a quick look at the construction of a piece like this. You see the three voice, violin, piano. Piano has two voices. So here we uh, were looking for the sections or the big cadences that identify the team. There are four main sections in the exposition. So these are like the characters of a play. So looking at the first theme, uh, it is in the piano, in the right end of the piano, this line there. So you see it go by, so... And so on, it continues up to there where uh, we hit a cadence. So on the bass we have and that completes that first big statement. We can count the measure numbers, it's also very handy because composers use, uh, use regular numbers. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That is one eight bar phrase with a perfect cadence in B flat. That's our first theme. This first theme now you see it's been it's r r transplanted into the violin and so that allows for another eight bars you can imagine of good uh, first theme material and we'll see where that goes so it's essentially all the same yeah we arrive there and then that is uh, our full cadence after eight bars and then you see the piano kind of lifts off a little bridge of sort that will allow us to go to a second theme so the uh, arpeggio uh, blah 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 cadence still, arpeggio that will be still. presented here with a chromatic alteration so so we reach the dominant and it will be there for a while you see it's there at the first beat and blah 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 so that means we have reached the dominant in the form so the uh, violin takes off uh, with that little scale all alone and introduce this new idea so we're going to hear it uh, modulating still playing uh, us keep our ears close to uh, the idea that we are uh, in F and uh, is there going anywhere? So now we have the dominant of F and the dominant full sevenths of F, and we arrive to F. Scales and da pa pa pum dom pa pa. So this key uh, that we the tone of C. Now that's a clear cadence, end of the second theme, and that tells us we have reached the dominant of the dominant and that is very good because that confirms that we had indeed uh, modulated in F. Now third theme. Okay in third ear it's introduced very nicely uh, just two voices and repeated on the violin following. Now third theme will lead us where or we don't quite know yet so it has a sequence going on where we reach F major uh, new theme. So that is our fourth theme. And that will, fourth theme in this context will lead us to the end of the exposition. As you can see here, we're getting to the, so that page is for the fourth theme. And this is a festive type of theme typical of, of classical sonatas in a, in a bright key. So we have gone uh, from B flat to F to C the deck to F. And that uh, towards the end we reach these long notes after scales and scales and it may lead us back to the repeat of uh, the exposition or continuing further. 
In this case, we have decided to continue further. And Mozart goes from major, where you have an A natural. By the way, he touches the A flat, so you have major minor in a little bit of a bind there, in a false relation. And this develops, like often the case that in the minor, uh, the minor mode is brought to bring something very emotional, kind of expressive in the middle of things. And that is not really so much related to what we had heard before. It's kind of a song on its own. It's a beautiful one and leads to the development uh, in the more stormy moments here where we have a repetition of that semitone that uh, is very uh, expressive. Uh, big jumps also in the violin and, and it's a long, long sequence. Well. allows us to move from key to key, so kind of restless, as one bit, here with face, and then, and I took a layer of space to signal place. The F, you remember, was the dominant of the main key. This texture, now it's kind of relaxing, and calando, which means exactly that, relaxing, into back to our recapitulation of the first theme. And now I don't need to explain all of that's coming up after that because it's a repeat up to the point where we're entering the second team. The team is not in the uh, new key but stays in the original key. And now from there all repeats essentially no surprise to the end. I can turn very quickly because it's like a, that's why Mozart could write so fast because the formula is set and then you just have to copy and, and uh, transpose. And then at the end, a little bit of uh, coda. Uh, just repeating over and over the dominant and the tonic to make sure we have all understood that we stay in this key, and that's the end. and Dante, you know, so walking, or about the time of walking, and Sustenu token cantabile, so very nice song uh, to be played in a sustained way. On the piano forte, fiorte piano at the time, it, it creates a lovely sonority. We play on modern piano, but uh, we are able to create some of the same effect with the pedal. The, uh, the sotto voce, which means under voice, so not, not loud at all, not a speaking voice in uh, kind of um, pulling the ear into this world of uh, elegance. We can think of Louis XV court, uh, Rococo Enlightenment Museum of uh, the late 18th century. So here the accompaniment is in triplets, so very fluid. It's hard to put the triplet in a box. Uh, and so there's often a little bit of give and, and, and take with the tempo. And it's against a duplet type of rhythm. Piano continues alone and invites the violin to, again to, to join it on the melody. And then that repeats, this little section again of eight bars repeat. The second idea will be again repeated, uh, eight bars, and, and starts with a nice arpeggio. Uh, and the melody is always in the piano, that's, that's all for the piano to do, and the violin, really in the role of accompaniment, very small interventions. I'm just kind of highlighting the, the main points of arrival in the arch of the melody. violin now is taking the lead and you'll notice the triplets have disappeared and then it's a, a more of a march-like uh, figure so I'll so a different character now so uh, we are going to see the violin develop a nice arch as well and uh, with 16s repeat the melody and that goes up to there so a nice again feminine cadence Then uh, develops uh, with a D flat and A flat, so going in the minor mode, 
gets a little bit more dramatic and that will help us to reach a big climax coming up. So that, that is developed gradually. You've heard uh, Jacques play this excerpt. And, um, but now on the, on the violin and crescendo, crescendo, cr grows, grows, grows on a pedal of, of uh, repeated notes and then reach a fermata. So this is an important point for the uh, violinist or the pianist to kind of improvise something. In this case, I didn't improvise, I just skipped it, but it's always to our, our discretion. Now, this uh, violin repeats now the melody from the beginning, remember? So though we are very familiar with it, it's not been presented in this way before. And the piano now accompanies back in triplets. Now you see at the end of that melody, we are jumping into a previous idea, the minor development that was right there when the violin played. And now it is affixed to uh, the melody that we just heard. So it's a way to uh, keep things organized. So if that was A, now that was B and C, so that part of C has been put into after A. So that's how the form is developing. And that, uh, as we remember, the dramatic of the repeated notes and so on, arriving to a fermata. Here, Jacques has put a little cadenza there. And now A comes back in the piano as it was at the beginning. Ah, that is new now. We have a final cadence, forte and piano. And these were the essentially two dynamics that were used in, in his time. Uh, now we see uh, chords, all three instruments playing chords uh, at the same time, isorhythmically, okay, so there's, and then answered with the violin kind of uh, languishing on these notes, and the notes are a little bit shorter in the piano, making a nice harmonic progression, repeat of the big chords, so that were, uh, if we were now at our fourth idea, be this little coda, so we, we end up on the, this is cadence, cadence repeated and simply finishing. So this little figure there, we'll actually see it also in Beethoven, uh, in the uh, slow movement, who knows, maybe Beethoven took, uh, took it from Mozart exactly at this moment. Finishes so. just nicely, pianissimo. Is we're going to have repeated sections. Now here of more than eight bars. And uh, so B flat, you see air F uh, arpeggio of B flat, followed uh, arriving to a half cadence, and then repeated arriving to a full cadence. We call that antecedent consequent. And it's repeated twice, and the violin joins in on the consequent. Then the second idea uh, with a sequence jumping around. And, and scales going again in sequence, and then you see the same is copied in the bass. So all of this is kind of florid, but the structure is fairly simple and, and easy to follow. somewhat or we're just tonicizing the dominant uh, and that is not yet confirmed and then see we're getting back really quickly so it's hard to modulate very far so it's more what we call a tonicization or from there it abruptly moved to uh, the, what we call the relative minor another cadence, and now we have a, a new melody. Looks like we are going back to B flat for uh, contrast, uh, having established this, and then violin repeat the same thing. These big uh, punctuating chords, for the purpose of coming back. 
soon to our original melody in this long trill that goes up while the chords are going down that creates a kind of a crescendo effect to reach uh, that melody uh, back to the piano. And we see it, the general rondo comes back. Now we have heard before this now is going to develop and that cre creates like a space here where you will emphasize the dominant like a question mark so the tempo and he moves uh, into a different meter for four all in triplets we were already in a three eight uh, so it's not a big big time but it seems suddenly much faster uh, the way that it's written so it's more operatic style uh, writing you see that in scenes of opera where you have different sceneries or, or movements on stage trumpet style or, or you know uh, maybe uh, janissary style of music with this type of uh, ta -ta 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 -ta, with uh, these uh, military uh, military bands imitations and uh, so it's very festive and it's it shows uh, soon that we're going to complete but we open a new section so uh, to respect the uh, kind of proportion so far this will go for a little while and, and then a scale that again leads us somewhere but we don't know it quite yet it just leaves up in the air and we could wait there forever if and, and then uh, that leads to the final return of that, that tune but now it is presented in imitation so that is piano first and violin one bar apart and uh, because we're playing the same first and that leads basically to our coda so from that moment here we have and all of this now will be tonic and dominant like Beethoven loves to and then finally this kind of virtuosic display by the pianist to, to show, show off this arpeggio and then the violin gives it a try as well just to complete and we end up three times on the same chord together. Here it is, the end of our presentation. I'm so glad that you could join us. I hope you enjoyed and learned a few things along the way. This is uh, the moment to say thank you also to the Worst Institute for this opportunity and to uh, thank uh, my colleagues who have been involved into this project. If you wish to comment or you can always send uh, some email to me by uh, gtardif at ualberta.ca and I look forward to hearing about your comments about the CD and uh, anything that uh, may have come up as a question as uh, I was discussing. So my best wishes to you, looking forward to seeing you in person, uh, maybe at the concert. The next concert will be very soon. Stay safe, goodbye.